Hey guys, welcome back to the Bucket Think Tank for another round of Comic Corner. And today we've had a pretty, it's a pretty lame week, not gonna lie. Nothing bad here, just like not too much. So we've got, first we've got Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths. Um, it's a one-shot war zone. And what this story really is, is just a bunch of, hey, here's what else is going on in this story. A bunch of other small stories, none of them are really bad, but this really just felt like a sort of padding. Like the first story is... Um, Linda and Iris, you know, meeting up on the battlefield and, you know, just find time, like, talk to each other. Like, hey, <laughs> I was like, Linda, wh where have you been? Like, oh, well, we went looking for Barry and, you know, superhero shenanigans, you know, in ensued and, um, yeah, he and Wally are on their way back at some point. Um, um, yeah, so they just spend their time. It's actually a really fun story just seeing the two of them talk to each other and, you know, protecting these two kids. And trying to get them to safety. That's really fun, but it's a short story. It's not really that worth talking about in depth. There's not a lot of going on other than, hey, let's save these two kids. Which is great in itself. And of course it ends with um, the Justice League showing up. You know, with the Green Lantern Corps. And that's cool. The next one is a story with Jim Corrigan. And the premise here is Jim Corrigan was just minding his own business, driving around, going off somewhere for a little vacation, and lo and behold, the world goes to hell. And like, yep, sounds about right for my life. Sounds about right for my life. Oh, look at that. Hang on. Hang on. Nice. Uh, but anyway, anyway, anyway. Uh, he sees a raven fighting an enslaved specter. I'm like, oh. That guy. Because for those of you who don't know, Jim Corrigan was the host for the Spectre for a long time. The two of them have a long history. He's been freed from, like, okay, cool, I can just be me now. But then he sees that the fact that the Spectre is, of course, enslaved. You know, God's vengeance is enslaved and fighting Raven. And he points out that this is not like the Spectre. The Spectre is usually, you know, impassioned. Like, he doesn't do this because he enjoys it. This for this Spectre here, he was enslaved by the Dark Army, is enjoying the torment, enjoying the pain he's inflicting. It's like, that is not how the Spectre is supposed to be. So, he ruins his life again by becoming the host again for the Spectre. But now, the battle begins again. And I like the name of the story, is just when I thought I was out. He's pulled back in, and... I like that. I like that. Um, Raven just sort of happens to be there and sort of like, hey, this is the person that um, Etrigan's fighting, that um, the Spectre's fighting, which I think works, you know, sort of sells the idea that, hey, Raven can to some extent hold off the Spectre, but not really. Um, also, the fact that, you know, the Spectre wouldn't fight Raven, like, Raven hasn't done it. Look, I'm God's vengeance. What, is, what has Raven done? Her dad, yeah, but she's not a dad. Like, her entire story is pretty much, you know, trying to not be her dad but whatever whatever so that's all right and we have one with the amazons which really just meant nothing it was like the amazons talking about like hey you know we're always ready for war and whatnot the amazon way we had nubia diana and yara floor fighting in front of the hall of justice that was kind of it all we really found out at the end was that in another one of the amazons um uh, uh, paradise is like oh we had a vision deathstroke is doing a thing with the dark arm you're like oh so you're telling me there was a part of the Amazons already knew about this. Remember how I said before that this entire thing felt like it was trying to be Infinite Crisis, although it's calling itself uh, the, like the sort of successor to Crisis on Infinite Earths? It really wants to be Infinite Crisis because this, again, like this feels like a bunch of events that should have been set up throughout the course of DC. You know, like, you know, had, but of course, remember, we would go and go to Rebirth and to Doomsday Clock and that would set up Future State and all of that just kind of fell apart. And, I don't, know, I don't know, maybe we should have seen the future state thing through to its logical conclusion, which probably would have still been this, but would have been better set up. I don't know, that's just my opinion. But anyway, anyway, going f And the last one is actually, I think, a really good one. It's the Green Lanterns, it's Joe and Guy trying to hold off the, the darkness, and it's a really cool scene because it really is just the two of them, 
and Joe wants to pull back. She goes, let's retreat now. And, you know, but God, and God's like, we can't retreat. There is no retreating from this. This is the end of day's fight. If we retreat, we lose automatically, all right? Save who we can? No, we either save everyone or we save no one because there's no, there's no second chances for this. So... Um, Joe gives off a really great speech that feels like she really watched Attack on Titan and really liked Commander Erwin. Um, yeah, it it was fun. It was fun. I think at the end it was really great too because both Joe and Guy give each other props. Like, hey, um, Guy's like, you did a, gave a great speech, but like, you motivated me. To, and she's like, you motivated me to keep going anyway. So they sort of were able to work together. And Guy's like, oh, I, there, I still have no idea how we're going to get through this, but we got to keep going. And I like that. I like that. That might have been the most enjoyable I've had reading Joe as a Green Lantern. I don't think Jeffrey Thorne's Green Lantern did her a lot of favors. Um, and her Fire Sector book, uh, I, uh, I like elements of Fire Sector. I just don't like Fire Sector in its entirety. Overall, this story... Oh, we got one more. We got, I totally forgot. So, um, Red Canary meets Black Canary. That's this entire story. They arrive back there, Red Canary fangirls because she based her whole costume and aesthetic off of Black Canary. She saw her perform one day and then there was like a robbery at a music store and she like, hey, beat the dude with the guitar and she's like, I have to play the guitar and I, and I want to be a crime fighter. That is it. And honestly, that's nice in itself. This sort of legacy that heroes inspire. Who comes after Dinah? Like, Dinah followed in her mother's footsteps to become Black Canary. But who's going to follow after her? Conceivably, I think her kids are going to want, you know, whatever kid she has with Ollie, will want to be Green Arrow. Um, presumably. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. Or I don't think she plans to have kids. Like, you know, she's got Roy and there's that random kid from Birds... I don't remember. I don't remember. And of course, there's... Um, Roy's kid, you know, I think she'll, she's bonded with that one too. Like, she doesn't really need actual kids. So, you know, who knows? Who knows? Overall, though, this story was more just um, finding out a bit more about Red Canary. And she's alright. She's alright. Um, there was really not much to the story. I was like, hey, this is the legacy. Yeah, we got it. She was inspired by Black Canary, which we all knew. But there's sort of a reason that. And it's weird that her canary oftentimes looks like a bat signal. Which is just sort of hilarious to me. And finally, well, let, let, let's go. Let, let's go to the to summary. So that was it for the first one. And again, this book was all right, but it really felt like we were padding padding this event up. Um, the stories were, I think, all good. The Amazon one was that forgettable. It's just like the Amazons. We do this. We do that. We do this. Like there's no struggle, no back and forth. There's no POV character we get to sort of ingrain ourselves with. So, yeah, yeah, that was kind of it. And finally, we have, well, I'm fine, we only had two books. Um, we have Batman 130, continuing the fail-safe story. And the fail-safe story is still kind of bonkers. Also, Batman is more hacked than I ever thought he could be. So if you recall last time we saw Batman, he was floating through space. Uh, he's like, oh crap, oh crap. So here, he is finding a way to land from space into the... <laughs> into the Arctic for the Forces of Solitude. That is it. So he's in space. He grabs a, an oxygen tank. Okay, this this plane here still has oxygen. All right, so he's got like 12 hours of oxygen left. So he uses that to slightly um, boost himself into Earth's atmosphere without burning up. I'm like, oh, I'm not sure that any of this is scientifically accurate. Um, it was just wild. I'm like, wait. So let's say the suit... Um, has some degree of protection from the vacuum of space. Let, let's give it that. Let's give it that. Let's meet halfway there. Or even if you want to say, hey, some of the explosion, and, you know, there was there was that, so we're relatively... Okay, but as we enter Earth's atmosphere, clearly his plan is to slow his descent enough that he doesn't burn up, but he kind of lost consciousness halfway through, and he started falling. He said... And he crashed. Well, he lands, I guess. He landed, and he just gets back up. Like... Yeah, I'm Batman. I'm Batman. <laughs> I don't get it. I, like, there was an explanation. It was great. But the whole time I'm thinking... You got superpowers, don't you? It's a Zer and R, isn't it? It's the cocaine Batman, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know. But luckily, as he was descending, he called out for help. 
the one person who can help him because what's in the Arctic? The forces of solitude. And who's in the forces of solitude? Superman, recovering from the can of whooping that the failsafe o- opened up on him. He's still recovering. Batman's here with Tim. Like, look, dude, it's time. I got a plan. I need you to buy me some time. And Superman's like, hell yeah. So he puts on a suit to help protect him from the kryptonite. I'm like, okay, that's cool. That's cool. But apparently, failsafe, being a, you know, more egotistical and less caring version of Batman points out, hey, you know what? I know something about Kryptonian physiology. You don't. You guys also, like humans, have pressure points. And he finds a pressure point that triggers his heat vision. I'm like, no. No. So now he's got the Scott Summers problem. His eyes. His eyes. But then, anyway, we come to Batman and Robin getting ready to engage Failsafe after he does the thing. And when Batman has revealed that at the... At the just like satellite, he was able to blow off a bit of Failsafe's um, armor, so to speak, so able to access the actual programming. Otherwise, there's nothing we can do. So what he's going to do is he's going to do the wildest thing ever. Inject compassion into Failsafe because he's Batman without compassion. I'm like, that is frightening. Frightening, and as we've seen, it is frightening. Um, he's still not killing people, which is still frightening, but whatever. So he's like, you know what? He's been able to stop Batman. But he can't stop Batman and Robin. I'm like, hell yeah. And then there's a really cool moment where Batman and Robin engage. And he talks about how the old moves are coming back here. The sort of the playbook for Batman and Robin. And then he talked about how Dick Grayson always, he loved going off book. He loved like, hey, improvising. Like, hey, they won't see this coming. He liked to have fun with it. Jason hated the rule book in general. He wanted to do things his way. But Tim, Tim loved the rule book. He loved the structure. He loved the teamwork aspect of it. He loved the idea of operating as a well oiled machine. And I think that's really cool. The problem is, that doesn't really matter. As this punch, oh my god, did Tim almost die again? This is what, his third almost death in the same event. Okay, anyway, anyway, so Batman goes in. Puts the flash drive into him, and yeah, compassion has been downloaded in the failsafe. And what does he do? He shoots Batman. <laughs> he shoots Batman, and we don't know what's going on. Tim takes the mask off, and he's crying. He's crying. You didn't shock Batman. He's not even here anymore. He's dead. You bastard. You killed Batman. And next thing you know, Failsafe's red speech bubbles become blue, like, all is well. All is well. Like, what? What, did you go from a red lantern to a blue lantern? What? And we look at the smoking crater. That was Batman. And where is he? The page ends with Batman in an alley. And I'm like, wait, what is this? And that's how the comic ends, ladies and gentlemen. Ultimately, Batman 139 was fun. I ne- like, Failsafe is so simple as a concept. There's a T-1000 Batman going out there, kicking ass and taking names. Alright? And he's been unstoppable. Every time we think Batman has a plan, he stops it. Why? Because this is Batman without the idea of, like, we have to protect, like, the team, or we actually have to neutralize it. No! No, this entire premise of failsafe is that Batman has messed up and he must be stopped. So what's Batman going to do? Well, Batman will eventually call upon his friends, all right? The Robins, the Batgirls, the Duke Thomas, Signal is his name, um, even Red Hood. is like, you know what? I don't care. I'm running them all down, all right? Justly comes in like, don't care. I'm running them all down. He hides in Atlantis. Don't care. I'm going under the sea. And I will wage unholy war on the sea people. He goes to space, I will be there in, like, space-time. There is nothing Batman can do that Failsafe has not answered, even when being injected with a total D&D alignment change. He's like, I'm still going to shoot you. And he shoots him. But where does he go? Gotham City. Maybe... Maybe Batman is aware of this. Maybe the fails by injecting him with the compassion, instead of killing him, he sent him somewhere else. So maybe he's totally changed the entire directive. But either way, Failsafe has proven to be one of the most dangerous creations ever. And you can say it's a bit over the top. Yeah, what, what stops Batman? Batman's own creation. You could tell him say that about the Bat Family. Like, if the Bat Family just like, like, all got together, like, you know what? 
with beating his ass. They'll beat his ass. That's it. But who knows? Who knows? Overall, this was fun. I, I liked it. Um, Zdarsky went in a direction I didn't think he would uh, think he would go. I think I was really expecting something more in line with Daredevil, which is weird because I always felt that his Daredevil um, in the early days was what Tom King wanted to do for his Batman. Who knows? Who knows? But anyway, with that in mind, let's bring this to a close here. If you are new to the Stop everything! Stop the video! Stop the end! It is not the end yet! We have a special video came in last minute. New book, Gargoyles Issue 1 by Greg the Goat Wiseman, ladies and gentlemen. So stop everything. We gotta talk about this. Because, oh my god, I totally forgot that this was a thing. Like, it was mentioned like once. I didn't think it'd be out till like next year. But lo and behold, Christmas came early, and Dynamite Comics, I didn't even know they were still around, brought, came in with Gargoyles. Alright, so, for those of you that don't know, Gargoyles was this amazing show about Gargoyles in the 90s. It was on the Disney Channel. No one thought it was going to be anything. It felt like it could have been along the lines of the Batman animated series. It was good, it was progressive in the good way, you know, um... Then there was like two really good seasons, then a third season no one talks about. Or was it three good seasons, then a fourth season no one talks about. One of those, Goliath Chronicles, not a thing. Then it went off to the comic books, and we saw nothing. People wanted it rebooted, wanted live action. I don't want it live action. Just don't. Just don't. Just, just keep it to the cartoons where it belongs, and have Keith David be Goliath, and just bring them all back. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. They're all still alive. They're all still alive. So anyway... Anyway, actually, oh no, the Archmage isn't alive. But pretty much his character was killed off in the series anyway. So okay, we're good, we're good. So anyway, anyway, this issue opens up. Actually, this entire issue has a really cool direction. It decides to be a recap, all right? And then it throws in some stuff from plots that are coming later. All right, so if you only watch the show, you'll probably know some points here. If you saw, read the comics, you, you'd be pleasantly surprised that this stuff still counts. And if you didn't read the comics well yeah luckily there's a page like explains hey what this is so anyway it's your standard gargoyle episode hey a thing has happened what are we going to do about this thing all right well send the gargoyles who needs the police they kind of suck at their job my uh, gargoyles come in boop boop a doop do what they do best and um yeah yeah we think it'll we go to um uh, castle wyvern well Castle Wyvern on top of Xanatos' uh, massive empire building. And, yeah, Elisa is narrating this. And, yeah, the first Goli the first gargoyle we actually come face-to-face -face with, with Elisa is Goliath. And they mentioned, hey, yeah, this is Goliath. You know, he is the leader of the Manhattan clan. He's also my boyfriend. And, um, yeah, it's weird. All that matters is that's still canon. And then the rest of them show up. All right, so Brooklyn, who everyone probably remembers if you watch the show, is Goliath's second in command. There was a whole episode about him becoming that, and a fun little story during the Avalon arc, where Brooklyn had to sort of step into that role temporarily, and then in the Goliath Chronicles, where he had to sort of find his confidence again and sort of be a leader. He's done it multiple times. But the important thing is, the Brooklyn's last interesting story was his love triangle with Broadway and Angela. It was kind of an unknown love triangle because Broadway just sort of swooped in and read Angela Shakespeare, and that was a thing. Brooklyn, heartbroken, apparently had a story where he traveled through time and found a Japanese gargoyle, and they have a child named Nashville. So, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, we see Hudson, uh, Goliath's second-in-command, or mentor, really, um, not so much second-in-command. He's now just an advisor to, to Goliath. Uh, Hudson chose him. Goliath to lead when Hudson stepped down so it was nice to see that Hudson was also the one to tell Goliath that he should pick a new second and it shouldn't be him so that was cool then we see uh, Angela Goliath's biological daughter with Demona we'll probably see Demona again it's never a dull moment with Demona and her mate well they're dating uh Broadway Broadway who was one of my favorite gargoyles and I was super happy to see his life take this positive change all right, it's good. And Lexington's here. He's the gay one. So it wasn't official that he was gay, but Greg Wiseman at one point said, I think Lex is gay, just haven't realized it yet. So we may see that story come up later. Who knows? Meanwhile, we cut to Rikers Island. Rikers Island with Tony Zuko, a longtime enemy of Elisa, not so much the Gargoyles, but hey, if you mess with Elisa, you mess with Goliath. So yeah, he and, um, what was it? <sighs> 
Thomas Brood, I think it's Thomas Brood. They're both in Rikers. That was an episode where they both ended up in prison together. And um, yes, yeah, this is actually where the bigger, the main story for the Manhattan clan comes in. Since those two have been logged away, their gangs have been pretty much going at it. A power vacuum has been created. And now it's just leading to gang war after gang war. This was, I think, a logical conclusion. This is sort of why characters like the Kingpin and the Penguin tend to not really get taken in because they do regulate crime in a way, especially Penguin. So then we get Cold Stone and Cold Steel. Oh, they're back. They're back. And I love it. All right. So Cold Stone is a, was, he's a, Elisa describes him as half zombie, half a robot. I'm like, that, that's, that's kind of true. Kind of true. He is a dead gargoyle that is brought back to life using science and sorcery. Um, the soul in him used to be three. It used to be three gargoyles inhabiting one um, gargoyle. So that was a cool idea. Now he's free of the other two, and one of the two was his mate. So, yeah, Cold Steel. Uh, was it Cold Fire? Cold, uh, no, no. Cold Stone, Cold Fire? Was it? Was it? Yeah, Cold Fire. Cold Fire. Uh, it's been a while. And so they're here, they had to track down their evil uh, brother who was, it was a whole fun story. Like, oh, uh, everything about this comic makes you want to go back and see those stories again. I sadly can never see the one about Brooklyn going back in time, because that was only in the comics. But yeah, they're coming here explaining what's going on, and it leads to a discussion about why the Gargoyles, despite everything that's happened, presumably the events of the Goliath Chronicles haven't happened, so they haven't been given the protection that they got at the end of that. Greg Wiseman is not like Goliath Chronicles. He left after... He left before the Goliath Chronicles. So yeah, in his mind, not canon. Totally fine. Um, so the question comes up now is why are we still bothering to protect them? Why aren't we going come revealing ourselves? We reveal ourselves as criminals, but not the good people who we're supposed to protect. Elisa points out that, you know, humanity doesn't even like people who look exactly like them. All right? They find totally illogical reasons to dislike the other for simplistic reasons as a different skin color or a different belief system. You are gargoyles. You weren't even that popular in your own time period. So, yeah, Goliath takes Professor X route where we're going to have to earn our way to being accepted by humanity and we'll protect them. And, but Cold Stone brings up a good point. Why? Why? And Goliath points out, because we're gargoyles. And a gargoyle can no longer stop protecting a castle than he can breathing the air. It was a line from Hudson, great line. It's apparently an old gargoyle line. And really cool thing is Goliath talks about how, you know, we'll use, uh, you know, criminals are a superstition and cowardly lot. And we'll use that to keep them out, to protect them. And at least like, did you just quote Batman? He's like, what is Batman? This is, I think, an in-joke because Greg Wiseman, if you don't know, he wrote, he was, I think he was pretty much the main writer for DC's Young Justice. So, great. Does Greg Wiseman want to write for Batman one day? I don't know. Up, up to date. Don't think so. I don't think so. Anyway, anyway, Elisa gets a call. Her brother, Derek. <laughs> her brother, a call from her brother. Meanwhile, Tony finds out that his bro that his uncle and his dad, are, or his grandpa and his uncle, are being um, released. And Tony feels a bit uncomfortable about that. That's an interesting thing. Are we going to flesh Tony out more as a character? That'd be cool. That'd be cool. Explain his hair. Anyway, anyway, what I was almost about to talk about, um, in the Labyrinth, which is this underground um, sanctuary for the homeless and, I guess, the undesirables, it's a better version of the Morlocks. Um, Derek, a scientific experiment, along with other scientific experiments, courtesy of Xanatos and Anton Savarius, voiced by Tim Curry. Oh, it was great. It was great. Um, he's been turned into this sort of monstrosity. He and... Oh, what was her name? What was her name? Maggie. He and Maggie, I guess, have been doing the deed. And she's preggers, and it's time. So everyone's super excited, also super worried. Like, was there... They really... Like, I know they don't want to, but calling Savarius might have been the best bit. They don't trust Savarius. Savarius is messed up. Um, but... This is foreign territory. Someone should be here for this. Meanwhile, one of the girls in the labyrinth calls Savarius. And Savarius, who's standing here with one of his gargoyle clones. Yeah, it was a whole... It was like his last story. It was weird. <laughs> um, they get the call like, hey, you should probably get down here. You should probably should have been here earlier. Uh, and turns out Savarius is working for... Thalog! 
an evil clone of Goliath, courtesy of Savarius and Xanatos. And Thalog has done so much stuff to Goliath. He even hooked up with Goliath's ex and then dumped her for a clone of Goliath's daughter and his new girlfriend, Elisa. It was weird. Thalog is messy and I love him for it. It's also the name of a character I'm working on for something else, something else entirely. But anyway, anyway, so then we go from there and the comic ends with all of them going to sleep for the day because I don't think I, I don't, I've totally forgot. If you don't know, gargoyles in this universe, they're stone by day. They turn to stone and by night they are, ah, yeah, it's really awesome. And so Elisa says, I have to go meet my new niece and nephew, and that's how the comic ends. So ultimately, this was a pleasant surprise. This really, truly was. I mean, ugh, I'd wanted Gargoyles back in some form or another, and was this what I wanted? Mm, maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. We'll just we're gonna dim that a bit. Um, overall, this was fun. I'm excited to see what Greg Wiseman is going to do with this. He's already brought in elements from the comics to just like the third page. So, yeah, I like it. Um, what is Nashville's dynamic going to be? Uh, how are they going to deal with Thalog now? Are we going to get that weird moment, apparently, in the comics where Elisa and Goliath, you know, they take a separation and Elisa dates the police officer who's also voiced by Keith David and Goliath hooks up with Delilah, the weird clone of Angela and Elisa, meaning Goliath can never escape Elisa, even if he tries. Who knows? We haven't seen Xanatos or Demoni yet, and I'll be really excited to see them. I'm really wondering what other elements from the comics are we going to get. Um, we might get the Quarrymen, we're well, not the Quarrymen, but we might get the return of the younger brother of the hunter of the of the hunters. So who knows? Who knows? Overall, though, I'm really excited. So anyway, with that in mind, if you are new to the Bucket Think Tank and you're excited about gargoyles, as I am, leave a like on this video, comment, subscribe. What's your favorite gargoyles moment? This is overtaking the entire video. So yeah, um, Batman did a cool thing. Um, Dark Christ on Infinite Earth was. It was a thing. And um, yeah, I will catch you all later. This is Bucket Think Tank signing off. Thanks for watching. As always, may your fandom serve you well.